Hi, Troy. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? I am uh, good. We're having our first sunny days of the year in Oregon right now, and it is wonderful. Literally every single person just goes outside at once, and it is every stereotypically cliche <laughs> thing about Oregon at one time, from everything Portlandia to people like on bikes that are two or three level high bikes. Um, it's hilarious, and it's really fun. Yeah, well, I don't, you know, spring fever is real, but I don't know, uh, in, until you go through like a New York winter or a New England winter, you know, I think maybe you're operating at a lower level of spring fever than we are here. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm just putting that out there, I okay. think, yep. you know, your spring fever might be good, but ours is better, I'm just saying. Okay, that's, um, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. For yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are, there are benefits, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let me uh, let me. I should introduce us because people may not know who we are. Um, so I am Philip Menchaca. I'm editor at MeaningOfLife.tv and BloggingHeads.tv. And you are Troy Campbell, a professor in the Department of Marketing at the University of Oregon. And your work focuses on uh, psychology, identity, belief, uh, consumer behavior. And we're gonna look at the psychology of Trumpism and um, some associated uh, topics um, really relating to uh, you know social psychology and uh, and behavior and I think a good place to kick this off is just a compare contrast of the Trump and Clinton campaigns from a marketing kind of standpoint yeah. sort of what they did right what they did wrong um, so let's you know, let's. Do you have specific thoughts on? Yeah. So, uh, I, so, um, so I'm a psychologist in a business school, and uh, people always say that's kind of weird. But if you look at political campaigns and you look at brands, they actually are very, very similar. And if you want to understand how to have a successful brand, a successful political campaign, or successful activism, you really need to know how to get the marketing right. And so. Um, uh, so in talking about before we talk about Trump exactly and Hillary exactly, um, let's let's talk about this general conversation around facts in modern times. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. let's have a very silly example. Uh, we're going to talk about serious things, but let's start off with a silly example <laughs> to sort of illustrate this. So imagine that you go to a party, and you go to the party, and you did not pick out a very good outfit. You look bad, and um, I'm familiar uh, with this scenario. <laughs> yes, I think we're all familiar with this if we're in the world of academia. And uh, we show up to the party, and we look bad, and it's obvious that we look bad. And you can hear people snickering behind you, like, "I can't believe he thought that matched." And um, and your friend comes up, and your friend says in front of everyone, "I think you look good, Philip." And Thank you, this, Troy. In this, in this situation, your friend is saying something, a statement, that is completely factually incorrect. And you may even know that that person, your friend, knows that it's factually incorrect. So the fact is wrong, but the meaning of them making that statement is very good for you. What they are saying in that is that I'm on your side, I still like you and you're my best friend. I think you're good. And in this whole debate around facts, I think people don't really realize how important the meaning really is of the statement. That when people are making statements, they are stages to communicate meanings about allegiances and larger ideas. It's not to get the minute facts right. That's not their goal, and that's often what doesn't lead to successful campaigns, uh, um, whether that is a campaign for a product or um, our president. So talk about facts and meaning and the brands that we have experienced recently. Let's just take Trump and Clinton's most famous or at least most memorable quotes from the campaign. So Trump's is obvious. Make America great again. And the thing about this quote is it isn't really a quote that's steeped a lot in fact. And if you and this was shown, if you went um, if you went to a Trump rally, as The Daily Show did, 
and they asked Trump supporters sort of, when was America great again? What is the fact that really logically sort of explains this? Um, people weren't able to describe that. But actually, lots of them sort of explained that that wasn't the point even. They realized that the point of America, make America great again was communicating a meaning that said there are certain people and there are certain values in America that we are not paying attention to. And that there are certain people who are good people, but because maybe they said something politically incorrect, they're being pushed down that the liberal elites have destroyed things and that that's what we need to fix. And I was talking to a Trump supporter one time and he said something which is, I, I, I don't think Trump says the right thing all the time. He's not always you know, factually right, but he means the right thing. And th that's just right. such an important thing. And they did lots of polls of Trump supporters and lots of Trump supporters said, I don't think that Trump will follow through on all these these um, promises he's making, but I'm still voting for him. And what Trump was there up on stage is he was communicating meanings that people felt. He was just like a rock star. Politicians are just rock stars as they get on stage and they say metaphors and hyperboles and people say, uh, maybe I don't even agree with the intensity of what Rage Against the Machine is saying right here. But I like the idea of it. I like the right. meaning of it. They're saying the people in this audience are good people and the people outside of this room are not respecting that enough. I'm on your side. I like you. The clothes you're wearing are all right. Um, now, so Trump was really good at actually showing a lot of Americans that he was on their side. Now, he's being a little divisive, more than a little divisive, a lot. But he was showing divisive, people yeah. that he was on their side a certain percentage of people. Hillary's most memorable quote is her phrase, basket of deplorables. Um, so this is when she said, you could generally speaking, put about half of Trump supporters in a basket of deplorables, which are the worst people you could imagine, like um, xenophobic, racist, homophobic people. And I think that statement is actually in a way even worse than what Romney said with his 47% comment. Um, she is literally calling these people the worst possible thing you can call somebody in modern times short of a murderer. It was, uh, it was a really bad choice on her part because everyone, it was a catchy phrase and uh, really caused, you know, a lot of outrage for a good reason. Yeah. And um, it, was, it was just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it was, it was just communicating to a very large percentage of Americans that I am not on your side and I really hate you. And maybe I don't hate you, but I hate all your friends. Um, and that, that is the problem. Um, you are never going to succeed in any campaign and no one is ever going to listen to anything or any fact you have to say unless you establish that you are interested in their welfare. And Hillary was not communicating that she was interested in people's welfare. And that's, you know, Bernie Sanders, when he was out there, he was really making lots and lots of people feel as if he was on their side and he cared about what they were interested in. Now, obviously, lots of people saw Hillary as on their side. Um, I think lots of times the Hillary camp campaign made decisions uh, based upon this fact that they just thought they would win and she just was like, I'm just going to keep saying the same things, even if potentially they are, aren't really gaining any ground. Um, but in general, she wasn't, she was communicating that she wasn't on the side. And this is something millions and millions of Americans now feel on both sides of the aisle. It's, they do not feel as if the other side cares about them. They, they feel as if the other side is their enemy and is not interested in how they feel. And, you know, some students um, at modern universities are feeling sort of this oppression from the left. Now, you can say that the oppression is existing or it doesn't exist, but they are feeling it. And they are feeling that they can't even say in class that they voted for the president of the United States of America 
when another classmate can write a rap about how terrible he is, deliver that rap in class to thunderous applause. And so those people are feeling as if nobody really cares about them and no one is on their side. Yeah, and I think, too, if you look at the campaigns, well, let me ask you this. Do you think some of it was, too, that Trump just uh, wove a better story about who he was and the future that he was going to bring to America and Clinton was was more reacting to that than creating her own uh, separate narrative? So the in- interesting thing about the election is all you needed to change the election outcome was like, what is it, like 50 or 60,000 strategic votes in different situations. So the reason Clinton lost the election or the reason Trump won the election was just a collection of tiny little things. And so there's lots of little ones that you can say, um, but here, here's two of them. One is that Trump very much stood for something and that it was sort of clear, even if it was ambiguous, sort of what he was about. And with Clinton, it seemed to be, other than the fact that she seemed to say she cared about minorities, it was really difficult to sort of understand what she really was about. And when you can't understand who someone is, it's very difficult to get behind them. Number two um, is that the Trump campaign were far better psychologists than the Hillary Clinton campaign. So there were sort of two, there were many, many psychological sort of uh, strategies the Trump campaign used. But one of them is they were able to identify this idea that we can suppress voters. So we know that there are lots of people out there who've always voted for the Democratic candidate who aren't going to come out and ever vote for Trump. But if we can convince them enough that Hillary Clinton is not on their side, that she is a detestable person, they won't go out to vote for her. And so they engaged in some very small targeted messaging, especially using social media, to reach potential Clinton voters and show them that Clinton was against them. And they used targeted messages using things about the time that she or um, her husband had said negative things about minorities. And it is believed that those things were able to suppress thousands and thousands of votes. And yeah. Yeah. So, so this gets, I think, starts to get towards the question of what's the best approach to communicating facts to people? You know, a common uh, method of trying to change someone's mind is just to, to educate them with the facts. Um, but if it's sort of an emotional decision, right, is what you're saying here. Yeah. That's so is a sort of just the facts approach ever the right approach to getting some, trying to get someone to change their mind about something? Yeah. So there's a lot of answers to this question, uh, but let me complicate it a little bit further. Um, so because this is something I don't hear said a lot. So. I'm an academic. Lots of the people watching this are very academically minded or actual academics. And you probably love facts, probably love facts. But here's something about facts. They don't always compel people to engage in the right behavior, even when people agree with the facts. And so, for instance, you can know that there's a problem in the world and agree that there is this group suffering, this group starving, starving, this group, this this part of the planet burning up, and you might not actually do anything about it. You might know that a food is bad for you, but you still might drink seven Diet Cokes a day. So facts do not always compel. And so one of the things that uh, I invite everybody to remember is the end goal actually isn't to teach people the facts. Most of the time, your end goal is to change their behavior in some way. So having a fact-only approach not only sometimes fails to convince people of the facts, but fails to motivate the behavior. And let me, let me tell a story that doesn't always make me look good. 
Uh, but I think it's a, I think it's a great example. So I won't, I, I'm at environmental conferences all the time and, uh, I, I'm then asked to sort of talk about the psychology of it. And, you know, everybody's out there talking about how it's important, how these wonderful books are explaining how everything's wrong. And the sort of untold assumption is that people became environmentalists because of the fact that they read this book or they took a class. Here's a story of how I became an environmentalist. It's a really deep one. I met a really, really hot British girl who had a really, really hot British accent. And she was an environmentalist. Uh, she came over to my house, uh, my apartment at that time, and she asked a question that had never been uttered in my house. I give her a Diet Coke at that time because, you know, that's what I could afford. And she <laughs> drank it and she said, where's the recycling? And I didn't have a recycling. I had a cardboard box with some notes from a class in it which became my recycling. I went over and picked out some Diet Cokes from my actual trash, put it in there, and I put it up to her and I said, look, I don't even have an actual recycling bin. I'm that environmental, right? And that's actually how I started being environmental. And the thing was, I had known all the facts. I had taken a class with somebody who won the, I, the, won the Nobel Peace Prize for the IPCC report on climate change, and I still hadn't done anything. The facts had not compelled me to engage in the behavior. And so that's just one thing that I like to remind people is that the facts aren't enough, not just because they won't convince people of the truth, but because they won't motivate people to act on the truth. And so if you're out there, you want to get people act, acting on the truth. So you want to make it easy and desirable. The sort of two principles of uh, anything in marketing is make it doable and desirable um, and people will do it. So have a fun event, have an initial thing that people can get involved in and that can change um, and that can really, really make them involved. And lots of advocacy organizations do this wonderful thing where if somebody likes a post on uh, Instagram or Facebook, they'll contact that person and they'll say, oh, I saw that you like this thing. Um, would you like to uh, attend a call on a, a, a big conference call tonight? You can have your phone on mute and you could be doing the dishes. That's all we want from you. And these little behaviors can get people, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll commit to that behavior. And then that can ramp up. And so we need to make people engage in the behaviors, not just tell them the truth. Here's, mm -hmm. here's one last thing that's really cool about this is that once people start engaging in the behaviors, sometimes their beliefs can change. So somebody might not be environmental, but then they get a really cool Tesla and now all of a sudden they are environmental in some way and now their beliefs will start changing in line with the behavior known as something um, as self-perception theory. So would you be, how, how do you feel about so-called slacktivism uh, where someone uh, engages in a very low commitment behavior like posting um, a Facebook status about, you know, pro environment or anti war or whatever. Do you see that as actually having this effect of hooking people in, perhaps eventually changing their behavior somewhere down the line? Yes. Um, so, two things about selectivism. One is that if you are a social movement, what you should do is you should find the people engaging in quote unquote selectivism, target them, and approach them in ways that can turn them into higher activists from direct messaging, giving, you know, um, a post on social media is a little bit, but then you can give them another foot in the door and actually get them to show up at a meeting, something that Surge and BlackLivesMatter.com are really, really good at doing. The other thing is to sort of not critique um, slacktivism too much. So it is impossible for all of us to be activists at everything. It just is, it's just impossible. So sometimes when we look at things online and we see people just posting a little bit, that is all that we can really expect from them in that area. Because no one's going to be an animal rights activist, an LGBT activist, an environmental activist, a scientist activist every single minute of their life, or even just on the weekend. You can't be all four of those things. And so what we, so what we need to know is that these low entry behaviors like changing your picture on Facebook 
they change social norms a little bit, and they can be very, very beneficial. So understanding the positives of slacktivism and then understanding the potential negatives and engaging with people to rally enough people to be your true uh, committed choir. And I think lots of times we react negatively to slacktivism because people look like hypocrites. They're like, uh, they right. feel so good about it. But that's just people. Like, people are incredibly imperfect, and we shouldn't complain about them being imperfect in this other way. That's a much better place that they could be than actually having a negative attitude towards it. Yeah. Um, so to, to, to bring this back to Trump, do you think that one of the, I mean, one of the, the complaints that I think you heard a lot from his supporters was a pushback against political correctness, so called, you know, yeah. and do you think that's um, coming from this reaction to sometimes liberal activists' demands that people be perfect or like they have a very yeah. strict idea of behavior codes? Yeah. So some people at um, blacklivesmatter.com have this concept of being radical and welcoming at the same time. And so what that means is demanding change, but being welcoming to those who are interested in changing. And that means potentially not having a massively high bar to begin with, right? And you, you can sympathize with somebody who was never taught all of these politically correct languages, all these politically correct words, and now all of a sudden just is expected to know them. And there's so many people out there who've done great things for minority groups or, or anything. Maybe they ran a boys and girls club. Um, and then they use the word oriental accidentally, and then the world collapses on them, right? And rather than saying, approaching that person and saying, oh, I see that you have done this other thing, or I bet you're interested in all this caring about this, so I just wanted to let you know why that is inconsistent with your other beliefs. So in marketing, there's many different phrases like this. But the phrase, the best way I like it phrased is tell people they already are the people you want them to be. Tell people they already are the people you want them to be. So if somebody is doing something wrong, you don't go up to them and just tell them they're wrong or worse, tell them they're a racist or a polluter or bad. You tell them, I bet you care about this thing. And so here's a way that you can act in line more with that belief. And it's also in line with sort of just the, the uh, theories around politeness, is that whenever you're going up to somebody, you give them a way out so that they never look bad. You always work on saving their face in front of other people. And even if they weren't caring about it to begin with or hadn't thought of it, they'll appreciate the fact that you tried to save their face publicly because you indicated that you were on their side. And... Um, and so, so this is, uh, so I wanted to add something to this discussion because uh, this idea of we aren't pro-black doesn't mean anti-white. So this is, this is something that gets talked a lot about. And this idea that just because we are something, we're not against you. Misses a sort of little part of psychology, which is, if you are not for me, you are against me. So the uh, psychologist Mark Leary at Duke University and colleagues have a lot of research that shows being ignored is the same almost as being hated. Because when someone ignores you, that means they don't care for your welfare. So all these activist groups out there, what they say is we're not anti and let's give them the benefit of the doubt that they aren't anti. And also let's give them the benefit of the doubt that they aren't communicating that they are explicitly anti, which is what lots, lots of people don't feel that way. But let's say even though we, we get to that place, if you don't say that you are on the side and you are interested in the outcomes of other people, you more or less are someone's enemy. And now this gets dicey and, and a little confusing. And I want to... 
I want to separate what I'm saying as an empirical truth from a moral truth. So I'm not saying that it is the moral responsibility for minorities or or allies of minorities to be nice and welcoming and show interest and love and care about the insecurities and feelings of people who seem to not care about the insecurities and feelings of other people. I'm not saying that that they have a, that anybody is having a moral responsibility to do that. I'm not a philosopher. I'm an empiricist. And empirically, what I can say is maybe they don't have a moral responsibility to do this. But if they do not do this, they will not be able to bring other people over. And we live in an we do not live in an ideal world. We, we live in this one and in an unideal world. Unideal solutions are necessary. Some that seem often unsavory. That's an unsavory idea that what I'm saying is that in order to accomplish this, you might have to be nice and welcoming and caring to the people that are not seemingly nice and welcoming and caring to you. And again, the moral responsibility, the philosophy of this all, I, I don't want to take a stance on, but the political empirical, the psychology would suggest that if this welcomingness has not accomplished this explicit statement of care for the other group um, doesn't happen, uh, then it's not going to work. And we see this. We see this when in, in the case of, uh, of um, advertisements uh, when they say, we accept anybody of any of any um, uh, nation, of any um, skin color, and of any gender identity, when people are sort of trying to be welcoming and inclusive. Do you know what often doesn't get said in that? Any religion, any politic, or any social class. And so there's a lot of people out there who are saying, you literally are explicitly leaving me off this list. You are ignoring me. Um, so a little bit of a ramble, but the point is people are imperfect. And because of that, we're going to have some solutions sometimes that are not maybe the ideal ones that we want to engage in. Yeah, I mean, I guess that that makes sense uh, in a sort of theoretical realm. I guess the question is how do you, operationalize that or how do you apply that to actual policies where you have um perhaps people on who, who like where it's perhaps some diametrically opposed yeah. um policies and how do you navigate that and how do you um win people over to your side when you can't really be for something if yeah. you're yeah so three things Get local, get adjacent, and temper your expectations. Get local, get adjacent, and temper your expectations. So what does that mean? Is instead of trying to fix everything on a global level, think about how in your own communities you can reduce conflicts. So whether you are on a university or whether you are in a small community, how can you reduce conflicts? And one simple way is go door to door and talk nicely with people. If you are a university, explicitly go on and show up to the young Republicans, the young Libertarians, and the young Democrats and invite them to your events with goodwill. So get local. Number two is get adjacent. Um, adjacent is the idea that Lots of times when we think about this conflict is we think about the people who are on the far ends of these spectrums. So for general speaking, die hard Fox News people and die hard Rachel Maddow people. Now, those people probably aren't going to move a lot quickly, but everybody in the middle potentially can can move. Right. There are people who voted for Donald Trump that voted for Barack Obama. And those, right. those are the people that you should be focusing on. So focus on the game that you can win. So focus on the person that is just adjacent to you but has certain beliefs that you would like them to move closer to you. And then number three is temper your expectations, is don't expect them to get perfect immediately. Expect them to reduce their electric 
usage by 10%. Expect them to maybe read a couple blogs about institutional racism. Those are the things that you have to start off with because A, people don't have time to be a perfect activist at everything, and B, we change over time. If you're teaching a class, you don't try and teach everybody everything and expect your students to be brilliant after the first 10 minutes of class. And yet that seems to often be the approach of a lot of social movements. Um, so get local, get adjacent, temper your expectations. Yeah, this is a highly speculative question, but All right. do you think... <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, do you think that we have come have gone too far or there is a point at which things are just so polarized that the middle is is gone um and you you're at, you are at those two far extreme ends and there just aren't enough people on the bubble so to speak where you can you know bring them together so yes and no so uh a long time ago uh John Stewart and um, Stephen Colbert had their rally to restore sanity and or fear in Washington, D.C. Right. And I showed up to that and it was very fun. And there were lots of different people that, that you know, they were on one side of the political spectrum if you had a one to seven Likert uh, scale. But they, they were still all over the place. Um, and there's a lot of people in the middle. And these people we do not see. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they do not post and they do not get retweeted. So let's talk about three ways in which the Internet is sad and is leading to polarization, but also hides the fact that we aren't as polarized as we think. So what gets retweeted are things that are emotional. A moderate, nuanced perspective doesn't drive retweets. Number right. two. People who believe their beliefs are superior, and that tends to be associated, research also by Mark Leary at Duke University, the people on the extremes, think their beliefs are more, are, are more confident in their beliefs and they're more likely to share them on social media. Um, and three, people who are moderates are often kind people who are worried about not offending other people and are worried about maintaining harmony and friendships. And so they don't post. And so if we look out the world, we will see polarization because polarization is what gets retweeted and it's what gets ratings on television. But if you wind up to anything, you'll see if, and if you wind up to anything, you go to the polls and you talk to people People are a lot more moderate than they think they are. And I love the analogy of politicians as rock stars. Because if you go to, if, if a politician is a rock star, then we can understand that the voters are the people in the audience. And yes, there are some people in that audience who are in the pit with crazier hairs than the rock stars on stage who know every word and are more extreme than even the rock star on stage, right? That was me as a, as a teenager. You didn't okay. know me then, but awesome. I did not know you then. You're you're much more tempered when we met. Um, um, and but most of the people standing behind them are just people in khakis and a band shirt and a ten dollar cup from Supercuts, and they're just pretty normal people who are just waiting to hear that single on the radio that they like. Be it satisfaction born this way or make America great or feel the burn. And they show up because they're feeling something. They don't show up because they are that crazy person at the front of this, uh, at the front. And so if we are a movement, if you are anything, what you need to do is make sure that you have singles that are getting people to come to your concerts. And then once you come to the concerts, you need to be accepting to the people so they learn the full album. And that's just something that we don't see um, as often with social movements. But also we can just be reminded that there is this huge swath in the middle, the non-vocal moderates who, uh, who aren't, um, who aren't uh, speaking. Yeah. And, and let me add one other thing, is that 
sometimes what we often think of as a um, as an extremist is is somebody who potentially can have one view that's really out here on this, but actually be pretty moderate in these other things. And so, yeah, maybe you can't change this person's view on this one thing, but there's a lot of places in which you can change their views or at least their behavior song. And people are much more all over the place um, than we um, than we think they are, um, in that they mo- they have more complicated belief structures, and we aren't just these like stereotypes at the edge. There's a lot of us in the middle, and a lot of us in the middle, like if you chart ourselves along that 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 one to seven scale of how conservative this idea is, some people are all um, all over the place. Yeah, and I think that gets to a broader challenge of just our current moment with the methods of communication we have where it is it's at least it seems to be increasingly difficult to communicate nuance and capture people as the complex people that we are um and getting that messaging out there it's 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 tough it's a real problem when what gets retweeted as you said are the emotional things the eye grabbing things that you know scandalous tweet yeah and so that's that's again why you get local and you get adjacent you yeah. and if, you, if you're going to change anything go find people and talk to them because when you talk to people often what you find is that they're less intense than they are on social media because lots of people will not say certain things on social media so for instance uh, even even myself on social media I will often not respond to what I consider liberal hogwash on my Facebook feed. Um, you know, just things that are stemming from a moral correctness, like the most basic thing ever that men and women should be treated equal, but just are just getting it wrong either philosophically or just having the wrong messaging strategy leading to change. But I won't respond because I know that I will be potentially berated and I won't have enough time to calmly talk to that person and show them that I'm on their side. But if that person were to talk to me in person, I would be much, much more likely to seem more nuanced. And what I found time and time again is the people that seem really extreme on my Facebook, um, the people who are willing to say these things, even them, when, when, when you talk to them, they're a lot less, um, a lot less extreme because when they are on Facebook, they are worried about saying anything that might be construed as as um, as negative, right? And they and they might be worried that if I critique this post about Black Lives Matter on a very sort of strategic marketing angle, I'll be seen as racist, and I don't want that. That's the worst thing in the world. Um, and uh, so they so they won't do that. So. People are often more complex and more moderate than we think they are. Uh, there was just for a simple, we haven't mentioned that many studies, so let me throw a study in here. Um, is, <laughs> Gotta get uh, one in. <laughs> uh, is that there was a study done where most people often hold contradictory preferences in the sense that they like rural environments and they like urban environments. So people have these complex belief systems, people themselves, and they know they do, but they think other people don't. So if they see somebody who likes the city a lot, they assume that that person would not like going to the country. And if they see somebody in the country, they assume that person would not like the city. And so we assume a simplified, more polarized belief system in people than, um, than, there, actually, than there actually is. Yeah. So with all this in mind, I want to wrap up with a question to you about your, what's your assessment of some of the anti-Trump resistance that we've been seeing happen? And let's take a specific example of uh, the Women's March, for, for mm-hmm. instance. Was that, um, you know, based on some of the research you've done and some of the, uh, you know, identity and messaging um, subjects we've talked about here, is there way, was that, in your view, a successful protest? Yeah, so success 
is a utility equation, right? Um, so in uh, so again, as a business, you would say when you launch a a new movie or you launch a new product or you launch a new product line, if the bottom line is positive, then it was a success. Now right. it may not be as much of a success as you'd wanted it to be. Um, so Batman v Superman, successful movie, not as successful as Warner Brothers wanted it to be. And so the question is not whether the Women's March was a success or not. I think in general, I would say yes. Um, the question would be, if it were to be done again, how could we do it better? Right? Right. And so one of the ways um, that we could do it better is to be more inclusive where we can be. Um, and that means, you know, some of that inclusiveness is the idea that transgender women did not feel as if they had a place in the Women's March. But the other thing is people who held any belief that wasn't super liberal potentially didn't feel um, a place in the Women's March. So, right. you know, if you were pro-life, you literally were told by many people you should not come to the Women's March. And if um, and there was this very interesting uh, article, I forgot where it was, where they the, the, there was this great idea for an article. The person went in Washington, D.C. and went to cafes and interviewed women in the cafes and asked them about the Women's March and asked them why they weren't there. Um, and I thought that was that's brilliant. And, you know, you heard different things that were said. And so one person said, hey, you know what? I'm a mother. I sort of wish I lived in a world where I could be a stay-at-home mom and you didn't have to have a world where there were two incomes. Um, now, whether she is right or wrong that the world actually would allow her to do that, the point was she felt that she wasn't included. And so the Women's March has this title of the Women's March, but a lot of people, I think, interpret it as this was the Liberals' March, not the Women's March. And... Uh, and so in the future, what I would do is, you know, it's just it's just like what Disney is doing right now. They're trying to expand their market into people who will come there. And you know what? When you expand the market, you anger people like me who are the Disney diehards, right? But in order to make Disney successful and in order to bring happiness to more people, Disney needs to expand to those people. In order to make more people feel involved and get involved, you have to expand. And that means sometimes not necessarily compromising your values, but being okay with somebody who doesn't all, all have your values and standing and marching with them. Just like how Glenn Beck and, um, oh my gosh, I can't uh, think of her name, amazing daily show person who now has her own thing on TBS, uh, Samantha B. Samantha B. So Glenn Beck and Samantha B. had a thing where they were together on an issue. Now they they probably hate many things about each other, but they were able to come together for that and sort of find ways um, to respect each other and not demand that the other person be all the way there, um, perfect. Um, uh, yeah. Now Samantha B. Show and Glenn Beck Show, I think, hurt their cause sometimes in the way that they are so. Um, polarized, um, but at least that example is a uh, is a good example uh, of that one. And hey, it's a good entertainment. <laughs> yeah, and um, and th that's the sort of last thing I would say is we need to be fearless in modern times. Fearless, and fearless comes two ways. One way that fearless comes is you need to go up to the people who you think are incredibly morally wrong and fearlessly protest them and call them out. But there's a second way to be fearless, and it is sometimes the hardest way. It's to go up to your friends in the movement and say, hey, I think we're doing something wrong here. I think we're being too mean to the outsiders. I know this is going to seem like I don't care about the cause or it's going to seem like we're compromising our values, but I actually care so much about the success of this movement that I'm willing to sort of say something that doesn't make me look like a good member of the movement to make the actual moral ideas of the movement successful. I'm willing to say, I think we're doing something wrong. 
And I think we need to be less puritanical about who we um, accept in the movement. And if you're looking, and so, and if you look at actually a lot of the successful movements right now, they, the ones that are successful, sometimes we think of as these puritanical places, but they actually aren't. So Black Lives Matter is an incredibly flexible and nimble place where each chapter, where it's located, um, often is very different. So a Southern Black Lives Matter place has a very different population than the San Francisco Black Lives Matter chapter. And the people who are in the central at blacklivesmatter.com respect that and do not demand a strict party line, right? They do not demand that you cannot be part of the movement if you are not, uh, if you are not pro-life, you, you have to leave. Because if they were like that, they would lose, even though it's consistent arguably with their philosophical agenda, it, they would lose so many people in the South. Um, and and I, I wanted to add one, one story about yeah. uh, uh, Black Lives Matter because I've, I've become more involved in talking um, with them li- recently and working, talking to them about what research they should use and whatnot. And I've just heard so many stories from them. And even I've had some incorrect uh, assumptions about sort of the movement. So one of the things that has happened to Black Lives Matter is when they are called to be on radio shows, they will often, oftentimes on a big radio show or a big CNN-like thing, they'll do a pre-interview where they'll say, okay, here's what I'm going to say. And they'll be like, oh, oh, you're going to say that nuance thing? We wanted like somebody, you know, angrier. Right. And, and, and so the Black Lives Matter often people that we see are the ones chosen by the media to get ratings. Um, and sometimes chosen by the people that would say that they care a lot about the cause. Um, uh, and so, again, the way that we are seeing some of the movements, they're less polarized than they think about it. And again, there is a huge moderate thing in the middle. We're not ever going to all agree. We're not ever going to sing Kumbaya with each other. Um, but we, we are, there is much, much more agreement than that is that exists and is possible than we realize because what we are shown is a very very biased view of who's out there due to who to due to sort of various top down and bottom up from social media ways that things get selected to come in front of our eyes yeah well this gives me both hope and makes me despair a little bit yeah <laughs> it, it seems i mean our as you're saying, there's a lot of unrecognized um, people in the middle, a lot of untapped potential, but it seems that our instincts about how to change people's minds or how to get movements forward, our natural tendencies may be exactly the wrong ones. Yeah. Yeah. So on the, on the, is this a positive or a negative thing? Let me tell you about one of my favorite and least favorite songs simultaneously. And it's a song imagined by John Lennon. Ah. So, Imagine by John Lennon is an amazing song to listen to. It's beautiful. It allows you to live in this dream world. If I just sort of turn off my science brain for a second, I can just love listening to that song. Uh, I saw it performed uh, by the Fab Four um, in uh, L.A. Philharmonic, um, and it was just it was fantastic. But that song is a lie. We will never get there. And if we are dreamers, we won't make the future similar to that, is that the world will not be shaped by idealistic dreamers who want to build this kumbaya peace land. It will be shaped by strategic, passionate people who can understand what leads to actual change. And again, the business metaphor works again. Most businesses know they will never win every consumer. But they're so happy every single time they increase their market share by 1% or 2%. And we should be too. If we are increasing our market share by 1% to 5% every year in different movements and different behaviors, that's fantastic. It is not fast enough from a moral perspective. But from a practical perspective, um, it's great. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Troy. Um, I enjoyed this conversation. 
Awesome. Enlightening. <laughs> All right. Well, have a great day. You too. Take care.